So we've got another great question from one of my subscribers, and that question reads, Keith, could you please explain from a reformed hermeneutical position the doctrine of double predestination? And that's a great question. So just looking at from the base level, the definition of what double predestination is, is the doctrine or the belief that God predestines some to glory and others to hell. OK, um, now the question is, is that biblical? And my stance on that is that it is biblical. Now, I will be posting a video of R.C. Sproul giving his take on double predestination and his view of double predestination isn't the exact view I hold, but we do both come to the same conclusion that it is biblical. So why is it biblical? That's the question. I think the two perfect books to use to use to examine this doctrine would be Romans and Ephesians. So does God predestine his elect children to faith and glory? OK, and the answer is yes. And we see that in Ephesians 1, 4, for he chose us before the foundation of the world had been laid. But he didn't just choose us. He gave the elect a decree of mercy. Romans 9, 18. Now, on the flip side, is it true that God predestines sinners to hell? And yes, it is. For the same vessel that he chose to have mercy on, another vessel in his sovereignty, he chose to harden. And that can be found in Romans 9, 18. He also, in his sovereignty, chose which vessels he would hate. OK, and that's also important to understand. Romans 9, 13. So if God is sovereign, it can't just be over the good. It also has to be over the evil as well. And all of that was decided before the foundations of the world had been laid. Hi, my name is Deanna. Um, I was part of a long conversation last night with a couple friends, <clears throat> with a couple friends, and uh, we were discussing double predestination. And my question is, what is double predestination? Uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding about double predestination. There are some communities that believe in what they call single predestination, meaning that God has eternally decreed to save certain people that he's appointed for salvation, and that is the elect. But as for the rest, he simply passes over and still holds out the opportunity for those people to be saved. Now, often, uh, double predestination is expressed in what we call uh, a synergistic fashion or a fashion that is called positive, positive decrees. In this respect, double predestination would mean that God positively decrees and determines in advance those whom he will save, namely the elect, and in the same method, he uh, decrees the damnation of the sinner, and that just as on the one hand, he creates positively saving faith in the hearts of the elect, he in an equally determinative fashion creates fresh evil in the hearts of the reprobate to make sure they don't come to belief. Now that is not the reformed doctrine of double predestination. Reformed theology does teach uh, predestin that d double predestin in so far as that not everybody will be saved. And so it's double or nothing, really. You can't have single predestination and, not, and, and just ignore uh, the non-elect, uh, unless you're a universalist. But the distinction is this. We had what we call a positive negative decree or an asymmetrical view of election. I have a, an essay on this whole subject in uh, the uh, uh, Festgrift that was written for John Gerstner several years ago, where I wrote extensively on the subject of double predestination. But the positive negative says that God positively uh, involves himself in working faith and creating faith in the hearts of the elect while he simply passes over the non-elect without forcing them into unbelief or creating any kind of fresh evil in them. So it's positive in the one hand where he intervenes to create faith, negative in the other hand where he doesn't intervene and, and create fresh evil. I hope that clarifies it a little bit for you. Yes, thank you. Thank you.